today we have Tata Steele um, for Matthew Teague and Peter Hodgson um, and they're going to be speaking about decarbonizing steel and steel's role within the circular economy. Um, it's how architects can work with, with the construction industry in, in employing circular economy principles that hopefully can lead to a more sustainable future. Um, the premise of these talks is uh, focused on not just presentation but discussion. So I, thought, I want those in the audience who are, you know, who are participating essentially in this discussion to ask questions um, after the talk, which hopefully be around 30 minutes. The point is to give the discussion and questions and any kind of conversation that happens as a result, equal billing towards the presentation. So because that's when the real meat of the questions kind of usually get asked, at least I find. This is the initiative that we're trying to do with the LSA. We've got John Nahar here. We've got Matthew Teague and Peter Hodgson of Tata Steel. And so on that note, I'll hand over to Matthew and Pete, who will take the floor. Thank you, Matthew and Pete. Thank you, Jason. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk for about half an hour, give or take, on um, not specifically Tata Steel, although there are some Tata Steel initiatives um, contained within the presentation, um, but generally the, the challenges that, that present themselves to the steel industry as a whole in terms of decarbonizing. Um, and obviously this is a huge challenge, a challenge that we recognize uh, and uh, are working collectively towards uh, addressing um, um, some of the aspects of the material which are perhaps uh, less than desirable in today's world. So I will jump straight into the presentation. Um, Um, please tell me if you can uh, see my screen. Not yet, Matthew. Okay, I'll just see if I can. Try again. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Excellent, sorry, that was my bad. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, yeah, it's great. Okay, so so to kick off, um, Tata Steel, just very briefly what we do, um, we're, we were part of British Steel until 2000, uh, where we were um, amalgamated with um, the Dutch steel maker, Koning Glieke Hogovens, and we became Chorus. And then in uh, 2009, we became Tata Steel. We were bought by the Indian company Tata Steel. And we've been part of Tata Steel ever since. And we are now trading as Tata Steel Europe. Uh, we have a steel mill in uh, Port Talbot in South Wales. Uh, we used to have one in, in, um, in Scunthorpe in, in uh, Lincolnshire, um, but that's now reverted to its previous uh, identity of British Steel. Um, we also have a steelworks in Amalda in, uh, in, in northern um, Netherlands. And really I'm talking collectively here about initiatives which, which are, are cross-national. So some of the things are happening in, in Wales and some of the things happening in, in the Netherlands. Uh, we employ about 8,500 8, people in the UK um, uh, across a broad spread, but the majority of the steel making is done in, in South Wales. Uh, we produce about 3 million tonnes of steel annually and we have a turnover of, of up in the region of £2 billion. Um, pounds. And then scattered across the country there are various other units which, which do things with the steel. So in, no in North Wales we, we paint steel and we make um, panels and profiles and that sort of thing. So whereas the corporate landscape is continually in flux and, and, and there's a consolidation in, in the steel markets and in steel companies that are continually buying each other, the way we make steel has been largely unchanged really for, for almost the time of the Industrial Revolution. So there have been changes in the efficiencies of processes, but the actual chemistry has very much always been the same. Um, but now there are new processes and technologies that are coming on stream, which make the decarbonisation of steel actually something which, which we can start to look towards doing in the future. So 
where we want to get to is carbon neutral steel making. We have a target, which is the national target and the EU target by 2050. We have a phase plan. The phase plan is in development, but it's phased because the task is complex and we have several legacy assets which we need to plan around. And initially progress is planned through, through technologies like carbon capture and storage or, or sequestration and carbon capture and usage and then moving in the longer term towards hydrogen steel making. Um, and we are already active uh, across, um, uh, across the company in low CO2 um, technology and, and actually getting that into our, our systems and processes. However, we also have and, and are active in promoting um, life cycle assessment as a way of actually looking at, at the whole life of steel, the whole life of steel within a building uh, and to ensure the ability to make optimum resource decisions. And as such, we built what we like to think of as a, as a world class capability in, in life cycle assessment. Um, Peter, who's also on the call, uh, my colleague is from Group Environment and they are largely responsible for developing our EPD uh, approach and also on the day-to-day -day environmental reporting for the company. Um, we want to try and minimise the use of, of our resource, if you like, through the, the development of, of design for reuse, um, DFMAD as it's now becoming known. Um, designed for reuse and recovery. So we produce EPDs for everything we make. Uh, we operate our own environmental product declaration scheme um, and we are currently unique in the sector in, in doing that. Um, but all of our sites are now BES 6001 um, accredited as well. So we are, are fully behind um, responsible sourcing. Um, to develop our environmental product declaration program, uh, we are the program operator. So we, are, we operate our own EPDs, um, but EPDs need to be externally verified. So we have third party verif verification is through PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, they set the standards um, by which, or well, they operate to the standards by which we have to operate an EPD program. However, within that, we are responsible as the manufacturer for gather, gathering the data on our, our products. So we do the LCA model, we do the background report, and then we produce the EPD. But the EPD is then verified by PwC as the third party, and then it's released into the, into the market. So you can get an EPD on anything that we make um, as a product. Um, for certain products, the product doesn't change very much um, in, its, in its life. It's produced and then it's, it's sent out into the world. That's certainly true of things like um, um, tubes, um, certain, certain um, material, which is uh, um, painted steel, for instance, which is sent out as a coil. Um, but for other products like panels, um, there are so many variations um, and structural decking and roofing. There are so many variations in the product line that we have um, a, a bespoke um, system where you, you specify what the build-up is and then the EPD is built for you. And that's also subject to this third-party verification. So that by that means we cover all of our products without actually having to spend you know, huge amounts of time on dealing with, with thousands of different variations in, in, in type. Um, the reason that we uh, talk about LCA as opposed to simply embodied carbon is the idea that there are uh, unintended consequences at end of life if you only look at part of the picture. So the LCA allows us to look at the, the implications of the material throughout its lifetime, particularly end of use, so-called modules C and D. Um, so we look at a cradle to cradle approach rather than a cradle to gate. It's harder to measure, but it's much more important in terms of the life of the, of the product. In terms of steel and its place in the circular economy, it's been long established that, that steel is probably the most recycled material. 
um, there are several things that make it possible and easier to do. I mean, it's magnetic or some, some grades of steel are, are magnetic, which allows us to separate it more easily. Um, so the scrap collection and distribution chain is in fact highly developed, very well established. It has been for many years. Steel can also be regarded as a permanent material. So once it's created, it can be reused potentially an infinite number, uh, in, theoretically an infinite number of times. And currently more than 95% of steel is recycled, um, but that is dependent on sector. So automotive and construction steels tend to be greater than 95% recycled. Certain things, you know, paper clips, that sort of thing might go into the ground, but it's a very small percentage. So steel is already a circular material, it already has a closed material loop. Um, however, there is a, a lag in the availability of scrap. So on average, steel is in service for about 38 years. Um, that's, that's typical of, of, of construction steel, for instance. Current demand for steel works out at about um, 1,800 megatons per annum, um, sorry, million tons per annum, and the available scrap is about 800 million tons per annum. So scrap availability equates to only about 44% of demand. So therefore, there's always going to be more primary steel um, um, in circulation than there is scrap. Um, and restricted scrap availability inevitably drives up cost. And then you get other problems with scrap, such as residual um, uh, uh, elements, such, such as phosphorus, sulfur, and then the so-called tramp elements, the stuff that's still sometimes coated with or alloyed with, um, copper, nickel and, and tin, amongst others, um, and zinc. Zinc, which is very common in automotive steels for anti-corrosion, and also more commonly in, um, in light, light gauge steel frames, for instance, are, are usually galv um, coated steel. Um, but currently, the methods for reclaiming zinc are problematic in the primary steel manufacture. So it tends to be done using something like an electric arc furnace um, or expensively dezincification plants, which use um, um, acids and caustic materials to strip the zinc and then reclaim it in solution. So currently the manufacture of steel, this hasn't really changed very much since the 1700s. You get iron ore, you get coal, you turn the coal into coke, you push all of that into a blast furnace um, uh, and put hot air in, uh, with, in the presence of limestone, that reduces the iron ore to molten iron and releases uh, gas and makes um, slag, which is you know, could be the result of the calcium carbonate bonding with other materials. There's also something called direct reduction, which produces sponge iron or DRI. And that is done um, using, at the moment, mostly natural gas. And DRI gets used in electric arc furnaces along with recycled steel, so-called secondary steel making. The iron that you make in the blast furnace goes into something called a basic oxygen furnace, which um, blows uh, oxygen through iron, further reduces it, reduces the amount of carbon in the iron and turns it into steel. And then the steel is, is um, normally, particularly in our, in our facilities, it's, it goes through something called concast, continuous casting, where that molten um, sort of slowly hardening material is, is turned into um, slabs or billets and blooms for further processing. The equations don't really change over time. So as you can see on, on the left in a, in a blast furnace, um, you get uh, iron from the bottom and you get carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and nitrogen off the top. These off gases are already collected uh, on site and they are used, um, um, carbon monoxide in particular used to be called coal gas and that is a fuel gas. So that's used in other processes on the plant. Um, on the right, you've got the basic oxygen process. It's called basic oxygen, not, not because it's simple, but because we add, we add bases to the, to the mix. So dolomite and things like that are put into the mix. And, and that um, reduces the amount of carbon in iron and, and the iron then becomes steel. 
The alternative route, secondary steel making, is through electric arc furnaces where electricity is passed through um, usually a mixture of scrap, direct, um, direct, directly reduced iron uh, and, and uh, other material to, to, to melt it electrically and you get steel out of, out, of, uh, out of that. But whatever happens, there's always secondary processes and so that will go onto a rolling mill and get turned into other things. What this looks like in real life, the diagrams are all very well, but these are enormous assets. Um, my first visit to a steelworks, I was, I was kind of awestruck really by the size of things. Uh, you can see a person just about standing just on the right of the blast furnace base there, um, dressed in, the, in, in a heat, heat protective suit. And the chap hiding behind the, uh, the little island there to look at the inside of a, of a basic oxygen um, steel making vessel um, on the right. And then electric arc furnaces, they're not quite as large as, as you know, some of the infrastructures that we get in primary steel making, but they are still extremely large. Um, and then everything uh, on the site is uh, you kept at a molten temperature in order to make it easier to work. And so the rolling mills and stuff tend to use very hot metal that's just come off continuous casting lines and, and rolls it into coils for later use. So that's what we do now. What are we doing in the future to decarbonize steel? What's our portfolio of decarbonization technologies, if you like? Well, we're continually working to improve our existing processes. So we are maximizing the use of carbon capture and storage um, and carbon capture and usage. Um, we need a hydrogen um, facility a hydrogen economy um, to to help to to reduce the amount of carbon capture and storage and turn it into carbon capture and usage. Um, there's something called the Sabatier process, whereby you can make methane from carbon dioxide by by combining it with hydrogen, and that reaction is slightly exothermic and it makes it makes methane and water. Um, the life support system on the International Space Station is based on that that particular um, process, for instance. Um, we can invent new processes. So one of the processes that we have invented is something called Hysana, um, which um, uses a, a vortex um, to, to mix coal. So coal is not turned into coke in this process, uh, and, and iron ore, and it produces iron, um, and it reduces the amount of CO2 used without any gas capture by 20%. If we capture gas from Hysana, it can be up to 80% uh, less CO2 produced. So it does count as an ultra low carbon dioxide steel making method. If we exploit hydrogen further and uh, moving away from natural gas, we can, we can directly reduce iron ore uh, and, and use hydrogen to do that. And DRI um, can, be, can be used in electric arc furnaces, or it can be put back into, into methods like Hysana. So by adopting a more hydrogen intensive uh, infrastructure, we can start to, to feed material back into the loop. Um, and then again, there's, there's electric arc furnaces. So is there room within um, our existing plants for, for electric arc furnace use to increase the use of scrap to enable us to fully circularize our internal processes? Hysana is important because it allows us to produce all steel grades without restriction. So we, we, we are not, um, we're not hide bound by our processes and the quality of iron that we produce. So we can actually implement Hysana much more quickly than we could, for instance, a hydrogen based steel making. And we have built one of these in, in the Netherlands and it's soon going to be moved to, um, to India uh, for full scale um, testing. India is where our parent company is based. Hysana can also process about 50% scrap, including scrap which is coated with zinc. So we can further enhance the recovery of zinc through this process. Zinc is merely a, by, a molten byproduct of, of the iron making here. Um, and it also reduces emissions and dust. And as I previously said, if we collect CO2 um, or, or carbon gases, carbon monoxide as well from the top 
of the of the process that can also be either used or sequestered elsewhere. So, as I previously stated, Hisana can reduce CO two emissions of primary steel making by about twenty percent, and that's that's compared to the, the current blast furnace basic, basic oxygen um, uh, uh, emissions. At the moment, we're looking at approximately 1.97 to 1.98 tonnes um, CO2 per tonne of crude steel. Um, electric arc furnaces, they're very much aligned in terms of their, of their emissions to, to how efficient the electricity grid is. So the mantra here of, of decarbonise the grid, electrify everything else kind of works for electric arc furnaces. And you can use 100% scrap in an electric arc. If you use Hisana or, or, a, or, or a new method um, such as DRI with carbon capture usage or carbon capture and storage, we can get to about 80% reduction of CO2 via that. And again, if we further migrate to, to hydrogen, uh, we, can, we can reduce that even further. At the moment, in terms of resource recovery, um, scrap usage in, in the blast furnace spaces oxygen route is about 10 to 20 percent. Scrap is typically added into the basic oxygen furnace. Um, it can be used to slightly soothe chemistry but it's usually used as a coolant um, so that when hot hot iron hits the bottom of the of, of the um, of the vessel we, we don't get um, violent reactions. It sort of breaks it up and cools it down a bit. Uh, and the new systems like Hisana it can be up to 50 percent scrap content and as previously mentioned, electric arc furnaces are 50 to 100% scrap. Over time, we want to redefine steel. We want to move to it being a truly carbon neutral um, material, but that will take time. So we have this, this um, intermediate uh, point at 2030, which will be about a 30% reduction. So that equates to about 4 million tonnes of, of, of CO2 and then to move to being fully carbon neutral by 2050. Part of the dependency there is that, is that affordable uh, renewable electricity needs to be there to enable um, efficient production of, of, of hydrogen and efficient operation of electric arc furnaces as well. So there are some, some natural limits uh, imposed on, on how far you can go as a single entity so there are external constraints. Um, there are constraints which are to do with the fact that, that steelworks are, al are already operating at, at a level of efficiency which is quite high. And there are always these laws of diminishing returns. So each subsequent improvement is actually harder to get to than the, than the, than the one previous. Um, so as I've already said, gas from coke ovens, blast furnaces, etc., are already used as reheating gases elsewhere on the plant. So there's a, there are high degrees of circularity already within the system. Changing any kind of energy balance on site requires the presence of alternative energy sources. And obviously, the, these are increasingly coming online. So we've got the very large wind farms uh, that are coming on stream, already on stream in the North Sea. The same in the Irish Sea, the same in uh, off the Welsh coast, but that will need to continue to increase, and we'll need to continue to look at the energy mix. There's also the economic arguments, which are that that steelworks are quite expensive to, to build. I mean, they are they are massively capital intensive, and and assets need to be used as efficiently as possible. Usually, we design things on site for a, for twenty year life there or thereabouts. Um, blast furnaces tend to get taken apart and, and rebuilt on that kind of cycle of about 20 years. During that time they're not switched off so interruption of production needs to be minimized because it can be incredibly disruptive if something needs to be turned off. They, they operate continuously. Um, so basically we need to maximize the utilization of the things we already have whilst trying to limit CO2. And as we change the configuration, we need to make sure that each of those changes in the configuration work with the existing asset base. There's also the problem of, of 
technology readiness levels or you know, how how oven ready to use a, 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 a in vogue phrase of the moment um, the low carbon steel making varies in in how ready it is for for upscaling or even you know out, out of the lab in some cases um, so we have things like electric arc furnaces and blast furnaces which have been around for many years and are probably almost at the limit of the technological advantage advancements that can be made um, you have we have things like isana we know it works there's a there's a pilot um, that's that's running at the moment in the netherlands so the challenge there is upscaling and then things like hydrogen and um, the direct production of steel excuse me uh, is is something which uh, we also need to um, advance and improve and continue to work on and in some cases government aid state aid is almost a prerequisite in some of these particularly in terms of energy mix um, across the UK as you can see that if we are promulgating an increase in, in renewables that has an effect on everybody not just on heavy industry so to sum up very briefly in the short term it's about using the best available technologies i.e the existing processes and maximizing the efficiency of those and then making continuous asset improvements and aligning the strategy in the medium term it's about looking at, at using carbon capture in its various states carbon capture and usage in particular and also looking at industrial symbiosis so in other words co-locating or making sure that we're within hubs which use each other's products um, chemical firms for instance um, con concrete um, uses a lot of um, blast furnace slag particularly for waterproof or, or water setting types of concrete and then in the long term it's the move to, to fully carbon neutral um, methods uh, hysana at scale and also hydrogen steel making and there are already things happening so this is this is the north sea off the dutch coast at the moment and uh, these are plans well they're actually already being being constructed now for wind farms and then on the uh, in the middle there you've got uh, the irish sea offshore offshore wind farm development zone as well which is ideally placed for um the north wales industrial hub which is centered around um, uh, the um uh, Connors Quay area, just just off the coast of Liverpool. Uh, we're also working with companies. Um, Nurion used to be Asco Nobel, uh, and they are uh, working with us on the development of a green hydrogen plant. Um, again, that's in North Holland, uh, but it's equally applicable um, to to South Wales. Currently. The, the disposition of a steelworks looks something like this. This is, this is based on Amauda in, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, um, but Port Talbot isn't dissimilar to this. You have blast furnaces. There's a small um, experimental Hysana blast furnace. You've got coal and ore coming in um, and the processed gas from blast furnaces is used in the power station. Um, and also for, for other processes on the plant. Any spare electricity is, is usually sent out to other users or to the grid. In the interim, what we're to move to is to use the chemical products that are made. Um, so ostensibly carbon-based product um, and to sell that to other companies that will then further use it. So we have a, currently an arrangement with Dow Chemical um, to take some of our um, our waste product, which is actually their feedstock, and um, use at the same time redundant or empty gas fields, ostensibly in the North Sea, for CO2 storage. And that can also be used for something called um, enhanced oil reclamation. So the pump pumping carbon dioxide into, into oil fields tends to push hard to obtain oil out of it. So there's a, there's a, there's a double win 
in one sense. In another sense, it's, um, it, it, it allows more oil into the market to be burned. So you know, perhaps it's not quite as simple as that. Um, and then fully carbon neutral steel making might look something like this. So um, we have a, a direct iron or, um, plant, a DRI plant, coupled with an electric arc furnace. Two of the new Hysana plants making um, a much more efficient type of iron that would get turned into steel in the normal way. Um, but then we have a hydrogen plant in the middle of, of the works, which is making hydrogen by cracking water electrically. Uh, and that would then become fully circular within the, the system. And uh, we would use, um, well, we would emit no carbon dioxide in, in, in the process in the future. However, technological advances to one side, um, potentially the largest gains, and this is a slide from the International Energy Authority, uh, might be through material efficiencies. So as you can see here, it, it, you know, um, in, between now and 2030, in 10 years, material efficiencies might equate to 43% of reductions in, uh, in uh, CO2 emissions. In the future, between 2030 and 2050, it might equate to a total of 40%. Technological performance, i.e. improvements in technology, it becomes less important, becomes less of a large proportion of the saving, which would suggest this, that the law of diminishing returns does actually uh, um, apply in this case. And then other fuel shifts, other moves, electrification, hydrogen, et cetera, become more important as we, as we move into the future. So I guess it's something to bear in mind as designers that efficient design might actually be as effective as improving certain aspects of the technology in the long run. And then just to finish on, on that point about design, this is a, this is a case study um, which uh, dates originally from um, um, in the, back in the 1940s, in 1942. Um, this hangar uh, was built for the Royal Air Force in London. Um, there will be prizes later for, for working out what sort of aircraft that is. And then uh, after a relatively short life, it moved in 1958 to Rotterdam, Rotterdam Airport, where it became a hangar. And then back in 2015, the whole thing was moved to Schiphol Airport, so another move within the Netherlands. It was made quite a bit shorter, but it became a bus station. This, if you like, is a very good and quite an early example of, of design for deconstruction. Um, and it's, a, it's actually quite an elegant structure in its own right. There's the use of lattice um, steel frames. Um, the efficiency of material use here is probably um, a result of, of wartime shortages, but it does show a certain elegance and a, a certain spare use of a valuable resource. And I think this is basically what we're saying is that going back to this way of thinking um, might be uh, an equally efficient way to reduce carbon usage, particularly in the built environment. And then when this building's taken away, you know, it could become anything. It could become a, a food can, a car, and you know, there are the, the uses are, are myriad. So just to finish, um, this is the roadmap for, for decarbonisation. So this is our corporate plan. Um, Optimise existing assets. Operationalized prototype processes. So Hisana, which at the moment is a prototype, will, will, will move and will become upscaled. Um, use carbon capture and usage, carbon capture and sequestration or sort storage and build hydrogen infrastructures to support that. And then move to hydrogen DRI based steel making, which will mark a full migration to carbon neutral steel making by 2050. Thank you very much. And I think it's two minutes over, but it's questions. 
Um, thank you very much, Matthew. Do you want to maybe stop sharing your screen that way when other people speak? We yeah, can, you know, I will. So, find my, um... there we go. Um, so I see a, a few people might have joined um, a little bit through that talk. That's fine. Uh, but just to reiterate, like the whole point of this kind of CPD program, which we're kind of pioneering at the LSA, we're not really pioneering, but starting, um, is that we're trying to give uh, discussion and the conversation and questions kind of equal billing towards you know, the presentation itself. So this is, I know it's a little bit daunting when you know, you're on Zoom and it's always hard to be hand up first, but um, you know, what questions you do have are here to be answered. We've also got Pete, uh, Peter Hodgson as well from Carter. I don't know, if Pete, if you want to turn your video on, that way people can just see uh, who you are. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, I guess uh, I can kick off uh, with a question um, just to get the ball rolling. Um, so if I'm using kind of um, steel, recycled steel or steel that uses kind of um, has been formed from the scrap, how does that feed into the embodied carbon calculations of a building, like in, I, I don't know that process, but maybe you could maybe ex explain that. Yeah, shall I shall I take that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, there are um. In a lot, in a number of different ways in which that that can be done. I think there's there's a lot of uh, actually different different guidelines in the in in the way that uh, scrap is is accounted for. Uh, in in those kind of calculations, from a from a, a life cycle assessment perspective, which is which is where I where I come from, we um, we, we assign a um, if you like a, a burden to, to the scrap that mm -hmm. uh, you know it, it carries with it some of the um, the, the origins of where, of how it was originally made. So there's a there's a there's a, a kind of a, a, a well-established method in the in the life cycle assessment world how, uh, that that, that um, accounts for for the the scrap use and the net scrap through a through a whole a whole system. So that that's that's one that's one method. But in but in things like um, the world of environmental product declarations, are slightly different uh, different methods. Um, really, that 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 comes. It, it, you know, you use, using using scrap, using a, an increased amount of scrap will um, will reduce. Um, as 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 Matt has, as Matt has indicated, this, the scrap is used in in the blast furnace boss route steel steel making to, you know, levels around maybe some something like between ten and twenty percent is is usual. Uh, it's not it's not just just iron ore. There's the scrap in that route as well. So. Um, you can you can adjust the amount of scrap that goes into into that those processes, and that will have an effect, um, uh, sort of a, a modest effect in, in terms of reducing the overall um, uh, em emissions, greenhouse gas emissions associated with with a, with a ton of steel. But the the issue really around around scrap again, as as, as Matt has indicated, is is that there isn't there isn't enough. Scrap arising in the world to, to meet demand. So so a, a specification of of a high scrap content for a particular project or a particular um, particular building uh, doesn't it, 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 it may it may it may work at a at a project level, but at a, a global level, and we're talking about you know meeting meeting the, the aims of the Paris Agreements so on for, and decarbonisation targets to to 2050. If we a specification of a high a recycle around a recycle content metric doesn't 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 really impact on the um, on the overall carbon emissions to uh, to the to the earth as a as a whole because you know a, a, a di diverting scrap to one particular project di diverting a, a recycle content to one particular project means that somewhere else in the world. That scrap isn't available uh, for for and, and 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 so somebody else in the world will have to have to um, increase the amount of um, uh, iron ore prime primary production. So on balance, there's uh, you know there's, there's, there's limited um, limited effect. Really, uh, again, as as Matt's tried to try to show, I think the the opportunities around around scrap and recycling are. And more at, at end of life designing designing to 
designing products, designing buildings so that uh, the maximum amount of material can be recovered at end of life. So that, so that is then available for, um, for making new steel. Uh, and, and in time over the next few decades, the amount of scrap available will, will increase. Um, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure gone into China, for example. So in the next 20, 30 years, I suppose, or so that, that scrap will come out of the system, that, that steel will come out of the system and be available as scrap. So, that, so there will be a, there will be something of a, you know, there will be more scrap available than, than there is currently. It will make up more, more of the, the percentage of, uh, of meeting overall demand. Mm -hmm. but, but, at, but at the moment, um, you know, there's, um, but by some way, there isn't enough scrap, despite its excellent collect collection rates, there isn't enough scrap uh, to meet to meet all de all de demand. Oh, thank you. I'm not, not, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I, I kind of <laughs> rambled rambled a bit there. But um... Uh -oh. um, I'm going to go to Ben Summers, who's got a question. Ben, if you want to, there we go. Thank you, Ben. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk, uh, Matthew, and also your response to the question, Pete. I think um, as you kind of wandered on to touch on there, uh, it's understandable that you know. From coming from your background, you focused a lot of the presentation on, um, let's say, the back end of the production of steel. Whereas, you know, perhaps, you know, as, as designers, we're kind of maybe more focused on the last couple of slides that you showed there about the kind of the reuse of structures where we sort of accept that there's a provision of a raw material steel and it's what we do with it that sort of is our primary concern, let's say. Um, in my kind of experience and research into the reuse of steel, one of the key challenges has been this attitude towards optimizing structures, which uh, I guess moves away from this, you know, potential for an idea of a, a standardized kit of components. And in terms of designing for deconstruction, that often means welded rather than bolted connections, which therefore, you know, vastly reduces the sort of capacity for reuse of these structures. I suppose my question is, do you have any in advice from us at a sort of industry level for designers in relation to designing for deconstruction and reuse? Yeah, um, your, your point is well made. I, it, so currently uh, I'm doing a lot of work with the Construction Innovation Hub on so-called DFMA design for manufacture and assembly. <clears throat> Lots of us think that there should actually be a D after that, DFMAD. Um, so the deconstruction element comes in as well. Um, we would we would I guess naturally defer to a sort of bolted construction as being much better in terms of decon deconstruction. But not only that, I mean because if it's a welded structure, which frankly you can always you can take an angle grinder to it to take it apart. Um, but the point with bolted construction, well-designed bolted construction, and by well-designed, I mean things like access. So you, you can you can bolt something up, put something else on top of it. You can't get to the bolt again. And so it's all about thinking through the, the chain, not only of assembly, but also disassembly, what needs to happen in order for somebody to actually get to a part to take it apart. What will happen to that part when you take it apart? Is it is it capable of being reused after that? And by, by that, I don't only mean that you, you don't damage it when you take it apart. Is it, is it the sort of thing that will be relevant to future users? Does it have a life, like a node, like a corner bracket, for instance? Will it, will it be capable of being reused in future constructions? A good example, in many ways, is the shipping container. I know it's, I know it's an off-trotted out trope, but there's, there's a reason why that's been around for 50 years. It's because, well, two things happened. One, one was that everybody adopted the standard. So the ISO standard for shipping containers is, is, is universally accepted as being the way to do things. We don't have that in construction at the minute. There must be four or five. I mean, in fact, I can name them. There must be four or five different modular manufacturers who's, who all do the same thing. But you can't use them. You can't use different modules at the moment from different manufacturers because they all join in different ways. So it's getting to that point 
And it's getting to that point for a long enough period that you can comfortably take apart something that was built tomorrow and, and use it again in 2050. So that I think I think is about constructing the kind of infrastructure which allows you to reuse certain types of building. And that might be sect that might be sector specific. I mean, it might be schools, hospitals, MOT, you know, it, it would probably be government departments that are most active in this because they have the in, in many ways the, the largest stake in 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 infrastructure um, development. Okay, I mean, so my, I had a follow up question, which would be, uh, I mean, your, your comment just kind of sets out that there seems to be almost a missing piece of the puzzle in, in even kind of getting to a point of being able to reuse, reuse those steel components because they, they're not interchangeable in terms of standardization. Yeah. I think from a designer's kind of practical point of view, we have now design and build contracts, which mean that even when we have clear design intent, it's not always carried through to the delivery of a building. So we could design a perfectly uh, rational system of components uh, into the ultimate level of detail. But if that's not delivered through the design process, it, I mean, you know, it, it all goes to waste that kind of work. But in terms of specifying to the contractor how that might happen you know we can't, we almost need a kind of british standard for this is the Brit british standard for designing for deconstruction that you must adhere to in in your in your structural design and well, but as you point out you know the lack of standardization at an even higher tier sort of doesn't even enable that so that there's quite a long way to go it seems before we even yeah and i think that just change i think i think that is change. I mean, check check out the construction innovation hub's work if you, if you if you want to have a look at that. There's something called the platform design program, where where some of those themes are being actively pursued. It's got to be said. I mean, there's, there there are several. We're calling them integrators. They were previously known as contractors, but I mean, it, because that's what they that's what they now do is they take yes. is they take the standard design. Standard design is derived by, you know, amongst others, Grimshaw. Are on, so there are architects involved with, with the scheme, but but that's what they do. They, they turn that design. So that's it's almost like pre-procured, because procurement is another problem in all of this as well. Um, let's not get into that. Um, but, um, it, it, but it is kind of happening. But it, like I say, I think it'll be constrained initially to, to government because government can control their supply chain better than, than perhaps um, private sphere can. I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. No problem. I was gonna have kind of just a quick follow up on that one actually, but because in terms of obviously designing for deconstruction, I think one of the biggest problems though we might are going to face is at the moment it's not really cost viable to store the material that you're sampling from a building that's about to be deconstructed let alone store it but transport it from there to wherever your site is or to wherever you're going to store it um just want to make that point i don't know how that kind of fits in with the current kind of construction industry climate at the moment i think that's one of the biggest hurdles we're going to face what do you, do you mean sort of having like a warehouse of deconstructed buildings <laughs> essentially yeah like you know in the same way that you know um, the kind of uh, the Chinese temples could be designed to be deconstructed, but they were cleaned. That's why they had to be deconstructed. Whereas if we're going to be using you know parts of a building, for example, what you need is a somehow a massive catalogue of what is available. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a co an ex colleague of mine, a guy called Terry Raggett, who used to be at Arab Associates, um, had a rather neat phrase, which was that buildings have to become warehouses of their own parts. Mm. And in a way, I think what he meant by that was that, and there were certain, I mean, we didn't touch on it in this talk because it's a complete, it's another, it's another half hour. <laughs> are, are things like the digital enablers to things like that. So if you have a digital twin, whereby each part of the building is identifiable as an, as an element in its own right, and this actually sort of addresses part of Ben's um, question as well, is that, it's to do with with identifying the standard parts and then where they can be 
effectively reused. So you could be actually designing a building which is meant to take parts from a building which is already existing mm -hmm. at its end of life and then move. You could have a seamless chain of components which effectively are never not in use, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. by enabling the supply chain to actually take pieces from buildings which are being actively deconstructed and then you know, putting them into other structures. Sure. I guess I can... I mean, the technology for that already exists. The QR code is a perfectly... As long as you can ensure mm -hmm. the, the longevity of the QR code on something, you can actually tag and track things actively through. Yeah, but it just requires that material tracking, doesn't it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, material we've... databases, material libraries, yeah, material stores, yeah. yeah. A market in second hand... Not just steel, but any mm. any building material. Yeah. We we try and in, you know in a circular economy way of thinking, we we conceptualize a, a flow of material around a loop, and in and in parallel, mm. a flow of information that goes that goes with that material. So that at each point in the life cycle, you can um, you've got the information that you need to um, to optimize to optimize the value to retain the value that you've embodied in that material. Yeah whether that's at end of life you, you know you know enough about where the materials come from its service history and all that kind of thing to be able to make the right value decisions about whether it's fit for recycling or reuse or yeah you know, whatever, whatever it may be I had, a question, I had a question about you said efficiency is probably the or potentially one of the most um prominent places for innovation i wonder if the lifespan of 20 years of the actual mills is there a way to extend that? And what are the reasons for some of, for that kind of short lifetime? Um, is it kind of change in technology or the kind of use that they give, the kind of intensive use that they go through? Uh, could you design those places for, yeah, for like 100 years or longer? Or are they also designed for reconstruction, deconstruction? Yeah. Well, to an extent. So so the last, last furnace reconstruction was in Port Talbot about five years ago and some of the some of the parts are reused I mean but some of the parts because you're right I mean that they run they run constantly they run at a temperature of, of, of something like 1600 degrees in parts um, you're continually pouring rock into the top of them um, this is blast furnaces in particular so they have a fairly hard life um, and what tends to happen is they fill up from the bottom. They fill up with, um, in, in some cases, iron, which isn't tapped, which isn't drawn off at the bottom, um, slag and various other things. You need to chip it out. You need to, you need to clean them out every so often. 20 years is, a, is an approximate cycle. Um, other, other assets last for much longer. I mean, other, other things do, do run. The continuous casting line, to the best of my knowledge, has been in use since 1967. There or thereabouts. I don't know if you've got any anything to add, Pete. Uh, yeah, I have, but but on a, on a slightly different different tack, I suppose. I think the themes in material efficiency, where where the, where there are some big big wins, in, in terms you know getting the most functionality out of every ton of steel that's made. I, I think there's some big themes for this group around um, adapt adaptability, designing buildings that, you know, for, for a purpose now and then in, in 20 years can be rather, rather than being taken taken down and, uh, re and the material recovered, can 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 buildings be be designed to for for another purpose um, or be designed in such a way that there's a lot of flexibility in terms of functionality adaptability. In the building itself, that's um, yeah. That's a, a, seems a, I think you, you guys know a lot more about that than I do, but it seems to be a, a lot of potential in that. Thank you for that. Um, if anyone else has any other questions as well, do just feel free to interject and uh, unmute yourself. But if not, I know that John Nahar, who's on this call, has set up a, a LinkedIn kind of group. Um, for which the discussion, if if necessary or if needed, can be kind of continued on there. Oh, I see Ben has. Uh, ben, I think were well, you meant to send those links to me? I'm oh, sorry, I'm just calling you out. <laughs> oh, I just 
posting some links that I thought might be interesting, but I didn't realize I was sending them directly to you. I can just post them to everyone. There you go. Thank you. That's not, not anyway, just some interesting other links for architects. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I can see a, a question from uh, Dinakaran. Um, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself or I can just read it out for you. Um, anyway, uh, they ask, deconstruction is said to be an important the circular economy and power plants. They think about extending life if possible. Um, how will that affect the material recycling loop? Um, I don't know if you want to unmute or yourself at Dinakaran, just so you can have a, a, a better conversation with uh, Pete or Matthew about that. ask you to unmute on here if not i think it's an interesting point i think i, I, I get what's been asked here it's um there there is a bit of a um it's tension i suppose between some some circular economy themes if um if you're if you're looking to uh you know get get the most functionality out of every out of every ton of steel that's made and and one way of doing that is by extending life and through through the adaptability re reuse um kind of strategies that we've that we've touched on that then does mean that there is less scrap becoming available at uh, at end of life uh, uh well so it, it delays the point at which scrap becomes available for for recycling uh so yeah, yeah that's a there's a, yeah. there's a there's a there's a tension there there's also i, I think a tension in in some of the things around you know you, you might thinking about um, reusability. That I think there's a there's a school of thought that thinks that says that uh, if you want to maximise the opportunity for reusability, then uh, a set of part a set of parts which are um, uh, more generic, let's say, uh, c c um, like standard 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 components, would enable more reusability. But that might that goes a little bit against some of the other themes around material efficiency, where where you might design components to to be um, structurally efficient, you know, putting material exactly where you need it in a in a section, that sort of thing. So there so there are some tensions. I think that's I think that's what the question is kind of getting at. Thank you. Um, well, if she sorry, so I've got a question. Go ahead, please go that's ahead. Jason. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry if I missed it, but with the Schiphol Airport bus terminal, were there any um, big hurdles to overcome from a point of view of like structural regulations or building regs? Because I imagine that repurposing these things has had like, is the quality of the steel still um, fine to pass through all these things or? Well, you can, you can, because um, you, might, you might have noticed that the, the, the structure got quite a bit shorter in its in its um, last use so you know from from hangar to to bus shelter it went it must have lost five meters um i suspect that that um declassification in terms of just things like wind load um might have had an effect it was certainly reclad um well, i can find out some more about about the the various regulatory hurdles um i must admit i don't 